As you may know, Pokemon Black and White 2 are perhaps the most difficult games to Nuzlocke. And so today, you know the drill, I'm gonna see if I can beat a Pokemon White 2 Hardcore Nuzlocke using only fire types. But this time, I'll be playing in Challenge Mode, a game mode exclusive to these games that bumps up the difficulty even further by adding extra Pokemon to the teams of gym leaders and giving trainers better moves and improved AI. And here are the rules I'll be following for this challenge, they'll be on screen right now and in the description down below. As for the Pokemon we can find, there are 11 potential encounters, however the Magmar line is exclusive to Pokemon Black 2, and Heatmore is post-game only, so we're gonna have to make do with these nine. Naturally, I start off by naming myself Axel the way I always do. We then make our way to find our first Pokemon, and uh, oh, hey Sven. Hey, you get a Pokemon yet? I got mine at the key, yeah. Dang it, Sven, not all Swedes shop, but I, uh, okay, fine, we do. Anyway, we don't get our Pokemon from the Swedish furniture store, instead, we get a Pokemon from Bianca, so we can pick our first Pokemon, Tepig, and we actually get to use our starter for once. I fittingly name it Pork Barbecue, and it has a neutral nature, which is fine by me. And now that we've acquired a Pokemon, Sven challenges us to a Pokemon battle, and oh goodness, he really did get his Pokemon at Ikea. In any case, you'll notice that his Oshawott is actually at level 6 and not level 5, which is a feature of challenge mode. Fortunately for us though, this really doesn't seem to make the battle any more difficult, and the only thing we can do is spam tackle anyway. Then as we're about to leave our hometown forever, our mom gifts us a pair of running shoes. Wow, she must really want me to get out of here fast. We're then also given a map from Sven's sister. Thanks, Anna, but what am I going to do with a map of Sweden? We then have another encounter with Sven, but this time it's a lot easier since we can be at the same level, and he still doesn't use his stab moves, so this win is pretty much free. Then as I level up Pork Barbecue towards the level cap, I make sure to only fight Pat Trats and Purloins at the first available route to get as many speed and attack EVs as possible. You see, normally Charon only has a Pat Trat at level 11 and a Lillipup at level 13. However, in challenge mode, he adds a Pidub to that team, and his Lillipup is at level 14 and holds an Orange. Berry. So to make sure we could beat that team with only one Pokemon, I went ahead and got a whole ton of EVs. And so with all those preparations behind us, it's time to take on the very first gym leader, Charon, and his normal types. And the strategy that I very quickly decided on was just going to be spamming Defense Curl for the start of this battle. I made sure to get to plus six so that I had the maximum defense possible. The thing that'll mess you up in this battle, even if you're not playing in challenge mode, is the fact that Charon loves to use Workup to boost his attack. And since the Pokemon we're most afraid of on his team is Lillipup, I made sure to have that defense boosted to the max before it even enters the fight. Not only that, we managed to take out Patrat without consuming our Orin Berry, which puts us in a really good spot. And so after spamming Tackle a whole bunch of times, we managed to take out the Lily Pup, which means we get to level 15 and learn the move for Flame Charge. Flame Charge is actually going to be a really useful move in this run since it boosts your speed after you use it, which means it's going to make a lot of potential room to fit into future strategies, but for now, we're just going to use it to take out this Pit Oven two hits. I know that I pretty much played it as safe as humanly possible in this fight, but you don't want to take your chances in challenge mode. This means that we're going to receive our first badge from Charon and move on to Verbank City. Here we can take a quick detour to the Verbank complex where I find myself a wild Growlithe. Now if I would have been playing Pokemon Black 2 instead, I could have found Magby here as well, but since it's the only location where you can find both Magby and Growlithe, I decided that Growlithe would be the more worthwhile choice. So I catch it and name it Hot Dog because it's a dog that's hot. Yeah, don't really need to explain that one, do I? But since we're already here in the Verbank complex, I make sure to pick up the TM for Thief. After that, as I'm leveling towards the cap against the gym trainers, Pork Barbecue gets to level 17, which means it evolves into Pig Knight. And so with that, we're ready to take on the second gym against Roxy and her poison types. She starts out with coughing, so I decide to lead with Hot Dog and go for Embers since it's way weaker on the special side than the physical side. And we easily take it out with three Embers, but next is her challenge mode Pokemon, Grimer, so I swap into Pork Barbecue. Now I'm expecting her to go for a Disable here, so I decide to go for a Defense Curl, but she actually goes for Venoshock, so I hit her with a Tackle, which actually gets disabled. Now, the reason I don't want Flame Charge disabled is not only because it's my most powerful move, but also since it's super effective against her Whirlipede in the back. And since we're free to use it, I can take out the Grimer with a few hits, and she then sends in her ace Pokemon Whirlipede. And since we're super effective, this thing goes down way more easily than anything else on our team. And listen, you're never going to hear me complain about an easy gym badge, especially not on challenge mode. Well now, I'd like to see a love story just like ours. Hey darling, what are we going to watch today? Hold on a minute, these two are dating? Excuse me, what? Anyway, with that behind us, we can move on to experience my love for boats as we head to Castelia City. Here we can go to the park and have a 5% chance to find ourselves an Eevee. I name it Salsa, and it has a gentle nature, which really ain't so great for a future Flareon. After that, we can pick up the ever-helpful Leftovers item in the sewers. We're actually allowed to go to Route 4 before we take on the gym, which means we can run into our next encounter, a Darumaka. 
Now, I don't know about you, but the first time I saw this Pokemon, I thought it looked exactly like McDonald's fries. It has a neutral nature, and I of course name it Large Fries. Then, since we've actually seen enough Pokemon at this point, we can get the Eviolite item from this scientist. This means that it's finally time to take on our next gym leader, Berg, and his bug types. Now, naturally, we have a really good type matchup against Berg, and I decide to lead off with Hot Dog for Intimidate, but also since we can steal this Dwebble's Citrus Berry. I then hit it with an Ember as it misses a Rock Blast, but the next Rock Blast hits us with four hits and almost takes us out. However, because of Citrus Berry, we could have lived a fifth hit, and we take it out with the next Ember. Berg next Pokemon is a Carablast, so I decide to swap out into Pork Barbecue and take it out with a single Flame Charge. This also means that we get our speed boosted, which in turn means we're going to outspeed this Levani and take it out with a single Quad Effective Flame Charge. I even end up getting a crit, which obviously doesn't matter at all, and Berg's final Pokemon is this Shelmet, and it actually manages to survive a Flame Charge, annoyingly on such little HP that Berg's going to go for a Hyper Potion, so we're going to have to go for a couple more to take it out. Overall though, a Bug Gym against our Fire Types? Yeah, he had no shot. This means that we claim our third gym badge and move on to Route 4 again where we meet Colress. Apart from this guy's life's work being a device that scares away hermit crabs, he also doubles as a Pokemon trainer that uses steel types, and steel types are weak to fire types, so you can kind of guess how this one went. Yeah, it was a clean sweep, better luck next time, Colress. I then go ahead and pick up some useful items like the Bright Powder, the TM for Dig, which is going to be helpful for the next gym, and of course the Soft Sand. There also happens to be a spot where you can find a hidden Firestone in the Desert Resort, which means we can evolve Eevee into Flareon. Flareon's actually going to be amazing since it has a really high attack stat and can learn Dig. Then on my way to Nimbasa City, I meet some subscribers and join Avenue, and they've got the right idea. You should probably press that button as well. I can then make my way to Lost Lorn Forest, where we can find our next encounter, which is super annoying since we have to look for the Shaking Grass, and all we get is a Pants here. I mean, at least it has the best possible timid nature, and I name it Piri Piri, but next we have to meet up with Bianca. Here it is! There's a gap, and it looks like... Whoa, 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 now don't invite me to your gap, Bianca. That's a neck of the woods that I am not comfortable exploring. But but speaking of places I am comfortable exploring, I go to the Relic Castle just to find the TM for Rock Tomb. And with that, it's come the time once again to take on my arch nemesis, Elisa. I go ahead and start out with Pork Barbecue, and she sends in her Emolga. I expect her to go for Volt Switch, but she actually goes for a not very effective pursuit as I hit her with a Rock Tomb to lower her speed, which triggers Citrus Berry. Because of that speed drop, we're now actually faster, so I can outspeed and go for a Heat Crash and take out the Emolga. That's one nuisance out of the way. The following Pokemon are Flaffy and Joltik, which both just get one shot by a Heat Heat Crash, and a Flame Charge, respectively. This means that Elisa only has some Strike left, and we're not going to have to worry about any Volt Switch shenanigans. And even though I have plus one speed on what's got to be the fastest hunk of meat alive, I still don't outspeed, and Heat Crash barely does any damage. However, since I know I can survive a crit Volt Switch, I decide to stay in and risk missing a Rock Tomb, but we actually hit and lower the speed. But now that we actually would go down to a crit, I decide to swap out into Flareon, and even though we have the minus speed on this Substrika, it still outspeeds and stomps, but luckily I don't get flinched and I can dig, which means that we seal the victory. And I mean, I was never too worried about this gym, but the Strike and Emolga can be pretty annoying, and you know what? At the end of the day, I'm always gonna be Unova's top model. Elisa's never stood a chance. Now that we've beaten the fourth gym, the level cap in challenge mode is actually 36, which means we can level up Pork Barbecue until it evolves. And honestly, I've never been that big of a fan of Embort. Let me know what you guys think. Who's your favorite fifth gen starter? And since the level cap is at 36, we can get large fries to 35, so it evolves into a full menu, or, well, actually just a Darmanitan. I'm, really, I'm just hungry. And these evolutions really make a difference at this stage in the game. See, normally, Clay and his ground types would be very threatening to our team, and the level cap being at 33 makes it so we can't evolve either Darumaka or Pignite, before the fight, but since the challenge mode cap is 36, we actually have a much more powerful team to work with. And so it's time to take on the big bad oil tycoon himself, Clay, and his ground types. He leads off with Croc Rock, and I start with an order of large fries, after which I get intimidated promptly. However, one hammer arm's enough to do the job, and he sends in his onyx, so I swap out into hot dog. Now the thing about this onyx is that it actually has explosion, so that intimidate's gonna help out a lot as he boosts his speed with rock polish. He then hits me with the rock slide, which doesn't flinch, and I retaliate with a flamethrower that does about half after after which I pivot out into Pork Barbecue. The neutral rock slide didn't really do any damage at all, but I'm fearing an explosion, which actually comes the next turn, and I eat it up pretty well, considering the onyx is at minus one, and you know, has base 40 attack. The next Pokemon to come out is actually Sand Slash, and I manage to outspeed this thing and go for a Heat Cratch, which takes it down super low as he bulldozes
closes and lowers my speed. The next turn, I know Clay's gonna go for a Hyper Potion, so I decide to go for a Flame Charge just to get my speed back so I can outspeed and hit him the next turn with a Heat Crash to take out the Sand Slash. Now here's the thing, since I got back to neutral speed because of that Flame Charge, I actually got enough EVs against those Purloins so that I always outspeed this Excadrill, and well, I just take it out with a super effective Heat Crash. That battle ended up being pretty calculated, and Clay can beat one of the hardest gym leaders in all of Pokemon. However, one fight that was just as easy as last time was beating Colrus in the World Tournament, which I actually decide to play a few more times just to collect some battle points. And this means that I actually had to humiliate Elisa in another fight, and you know me, I'm always up to do that. But here's the thing, with those battle points, we can actually exchange three of them to get a Fire Stone, which means we're going to have an easy way to evolve both Piri Piri and Hot Dog. So I decided to evolve Piri Piri right away, but with Growlithe, I'm waiting to get Crunch before I evolve into Arcanine, since that thing really doesn't get anything whatsoever. Oh, and uh, yay, Poop Monkey! I then head through Chargestone Cave and get to Miss Stralton City, where I receive the Master Ball from Professor Juniper, which is going to be super helpful since we can now access the ruins through the Relic Passage. And in Pokemon Black and White 2, that means that we get to catch ourselves a Volcarona, and I'm not taking any chances here. I just threw the Master Ball right away. And I gotta tell you, Volcarona is an absolute monster. I managed to get a speed boosting nature, which is even better. I name it Habanero and move on to the Celestial Tower, where I can pick up the TM for Will-O-Wisp and encounter my next encounter, Litwick. Sadly, not shiny this time, though. And to top that off, it even has a brave nature, which is like the worst thing it could possibly have. I name my Litwick Ghost Pepper for pretty obvious reasons, and the next interesting thing that happened is that it evolved into a Lampent. And this means it's finally time to take on the sixth gym versus Skyla and her flying types. She leads off with Swoobat, and I decide to oddly enough lead off with Embor, even though it's a fighting type just because I have the Thunder Punch. And even though it outspeeds and hits us with an attract, the power of barbecue is stronger than love, so we take it out with a single Thunder Punch. Next up is Swanna, and since I'm at full health, I decide to risk an attack, and it goes for Feather Dance, which halves my attack, but since I'm quad effective with Thunder Punch, it does the job anyway. Then we got Sigilyph to deal with, and I know this thing wants to go for Hypnosis, so I decide to stay in just so that I can get a safe switch in without getting put to sleep. So I decide to go into Salsa, who gets hit by a Psychic on the switch, but takes it fairly well and can then just take out the Sigilyph with two bites. This means that the final Pokemon we're going to have to face is Skarmory, and since I'm at about half health, I decide to just swap out Flareon here. But on the switch, Skarmory actually goes for Agility, so I get the chance to go for a Yawn the next turn, but not before getting hit by a Crit Aerial Ace, which does way over half. After getting off the Yawn, I switch into Large Fries, who also gets crit by Aerial Ace. What's going on? After that, I go for a Fire Punch, taking it down to Sturdy and activating its Citrus Berry, and the next turn it wakes up and goes for an Aerial Ace, which luckily doesn't get a crit, and I can take it out with another Fire Punch. I'm certainly very glad we didn't lose Large Fries there, as it's a very important part of our meal composition. I mean, team composition. What are we talking about? Anyway, uh, next up, we're taking the plane to Lentimus Town, where we can actually find our next encounter of the run. And this means that we can finally get access to my boy Numel, which I capture and name Hot Pocket. And it actually has the ability Simple, which is such a great ability since it doubles any stat changes to the Pokemon, which is going to come in handy. It also just evolves into Camera Up as soon as we level it up, which is awesome. And while we're here in Lentimus Town, we might as well pick up the TM for Shadow Ball and the Dusk Stone inside the scary house. And with the Dusk Stone in hand, you know it, we can evolve Ghost Pepper into a Chandelure, but it just doesn't feel the same when it's not shiny, you know what I mean? Anyway, after a close call and a Darmanitan mirror match, we end up making it out, but just barely, and I decide to evolve Hot Dog into an Arcanine at this point since we finally got the move for Crunch, and I mean, who doesn't love Arcanine? Let me know if you don't love Arcanine in the comments, and uh, what's wrong with you? Oh hey, is that you, Axel? Let's have a Pokemon battle, that's a fantastic ID. Okay, first of all, Sven, English speakers pronounce it idea and not ID, that's, that's a different thing. And secondly, it's not even a fantastic idea at that, but okay. Anyways, after this Unpheasant goes for a Detect and then a Taunt, I just take it out with a single Thunder Punch. Sven then thinks he's being cheeky and sends out his water type Samurott, but since I actually have the Choice Scarf item, I can just slap him with a Thunder Punch and take him out in one hit. I'm not exactly sure how you slap someone with a punch, but I'm not gonna redo that take. Since I'm locked into Thunder Punch with my Choice Scarf that I got from the World Tournament, I decided to swap into Hot Dog, who can take care of this Simisage easily. Also, don't pick fights, Sven. It's not very Swedish. I can buy Pokeballs sold here because somewhere, somebody is making them. Thank you, person I don't know making Pokeballs somewhere. Uh, you're welcome, but how do you live in the Pokemon world and not know about Sylphco? What the fuck? Anyway, on my way to Opelucid City, we run into this guy who has a 999 win streak, and we just smoke him. Way to pick your opponents, guy with steel types. Do -do 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 -do, just doing some what, huh? What's that? Oh, it's a, oh my goodness. Oh, it's a giant, what is that thing? Ugh, kill it with fire before it lays eggs. 
Now listen, so far, we've had a pretty good time with this run. No deaths so far, it's looking pretty good. It's time we face the seventh gym against Drayden and his dragon types. First turn, I burn the Dredagon as it misses a rock slide. I then go ahead and swap out into Pork Barbecue, takes the neutral rock slide once again very well. The next turn, I decide to go for a Brick Break, which gets a crit and actually just clean knocks out the Dredagon. After that, Drayden's next Pokemon is Flygon, so I think he's gonna go for Earth Power and swap out into Ghost Pepper, who can dodge the Earth Power with the Air Balloon. This means that the Flygon has to go for Crunch, which does hit super effectively, and I actually get the Flame Body as I hit it with the Shadow Ball. Now, I know he's got a Hyper Potion here, but I also know I can't take him out in one hit, and he can take me out in one hit after that. So I decide to swap out into Piri Piri, who goes for a powerful Fire Blast, doing about half, but then unfortunately has to go down to an Earth Power. You'll be dearly missed, Poop Monkey. And the next turn here, I make a little bit of a mistake, because I go into Hot Tog to get the Intimidate, but Earth Power, of course, is a special move, and I don't take this Flygon. Flygon out with a flamethrower, and I barely survive on 21 HP. Flygon going down to burn. That was brutal. Anyway, next is Alteria, so I decided to switch Hot Dog out, who's not doing too hot, and go into Habanero, who can tank these special hits really well and burn the Altaria. The Altaria then goes for a Cotton Guard, which boosts its defense a lot, but I'm hitting it on the special side anyway with my Silver Winds, which I managed to take it out with after just two hits and some burn. This means that Drayden only has Haxorus left, and since I'm faster with Habanero, I go for Will-O-Wisp, but I end up missing, and he goes for a Dragon Tail here, so I think I'm out for the count, but I end up surviving on 4 HP, getting the burn with Flame Body. What is going on? Then I get dragged out into Pork Barbecue from the Dragon Tail, and I can go for a Brick Break as he Dragon Dances, which is kind of scary, but since he's burned, I'm not too worried about it. And the other fact is that he only has moves that can't really hurt me, like Shadow Claw. This means I can just take out the Haxorus with yet another Brick Break, and we claim our victory, but at a cost. Unfortunately, we lost Piri Piri, but now that we've won, we have to take on Team Plasma, and I don't know what it is with them either. They just pick types that we're good against, so we pretty much just destroy his entire team. Should have picked water types. Uh, hold on a second, let me just take this call. Holy meatballs, Axel, have you seen? Swedish winter has come early. No, Sven, don't be an idiot. The evil space pirates just attacked with their ice cannon from their flying ship. Okay, look, I know the meme is that I'm the idiot, but what you're saying sounds so stupid. What the fuck? Anyway, we proceed to the eighth gym, which is actually a water type gym, which you might think would give me a lot of trouble even through the gym trainers, but I somehow managed to take care of them easy peasy. And that means that it's finally time for us to take on the last gym leader, Marlin, and his water types. And I decide to lead off the battle with a Thunder Punch, thinking it would KO, but Waylord actually survives and sets up a Rain Dance the first turn. Next up, I'm fairly confident that Marlin's gonna go for a Hyper Potion, so I decide to go for a Workup just to boost my attack a little bit so that my next Thunder Punch actually gets the KO. This means we're at full health and we got the first obstacle out of the way, but he did set up the Rain, which is very scary. Now, my plan for his Caracosta was to relearn Arm Thrust, but seeing the damage we're doing, there's no way I'm gonna, oh, Okay, I just got five hits. That's that's actually incredible. After that, we have to face off against Mantine or Mantine or, I mean, I've always said Mantine. Is this supposed to be Mantine? Well, we get confused and we hurt ourselves in confusion and the rain stops, so I decide to swap out into Hot Dog. This, of course, means that Hot Dog is gonna feel the wrath of this Mantine Scald, but it doesn't quite do enough and we can finish this thing off with a quad effective Thunder Fang. This means that Marlin's only remaining Pokemon is a Jellicent, but since I'm unsure I can take it out in one hit, we go into Salsa. And what I did here was more of a sacrificial play than anything else, because Salsa does have Bite, and I knew it wasn't going to be able to take it out, and I knew we were going to get one shot by a Scald. I'm really sorry to have to see you go, Salsa, but Intimidate is just an invaluable resource, and I think we're really going to need it later on in the run. But this means that Jellicent is in a range where one Crunch can take it out, and we're done with the Gym Badges. But being done with the Gym Challenge, means that we of course have to take on the frozen space pirates. And Sven still swears that the space pirates aren't real, they can't hurt me, but that doesn't mean that I can't hurt them. And that's exactly what I did. Zinzolin actually has some pretty fast Pokemon, so with the wrong type he can be quite tricky, but with fire types, eh. But when it comes to Team Plasma, the difficult fights are really only starting, and now we have to face off against Colrus, who's a lot more difficult in this fight than he's been before. I start off the battle by bringing him down to his sturdy with a fire punch as he paralyzes me with Thunder Wave, which I heal off with a Cherry Berry. Knowing that the super intelligent AI is going to heal with a Full Restore, I decide to go for a Brick Break, bringing it down to Sturdy again, which means I can just take it out the next turn since I outsmart.
speed. Next up is Chorus's Magnazone, so expecting a Thunder Wave, I go for a U-turn to break it sturdy and simultaneously swap out into Hot Pocket, which actually is immune. And remember how Hot Pocket has Simple, so it gets double its stat boosts? I decide to go for Amnesia, which gives me plus four special defense. This in turn means that the next Flash Cannon does absolutely nothing, and I can take this thing out with a quad effective Earth Power. Our next opponent after that is a Kling Clang that goes for Shift Gear, but that doesn't really help it out since I just absolutely demolish it with a Lava Plume. Chorus then sends in his Behem, and it goes for a Psychic that does a fair amount of damage, and since I'm now in crit range, I decide to swap out into Habanero. Volcarona actually has a really decent special defense stat, so I can just take this thing out the following turn with a Silverwind. This means that the only remaining Pokemon on Chorus' team is a Matang, so we've set ourselves up pretty well since we can just one-shot it with a Heat Wave. I'm glad we don't have to deal with Space Hair anymore. And say what you will about Getsis, but he's got a pretty goaded gaming setup if I do say so myself. But before we can actually battle him, we have to battle against White Curum, and this can be a pretty scary fight, but I think I have a strategy that's gonna work, and that's using Habanero. Like I mentioned earlier, Volcarona's special defense is actually pretty impressive, so we can just take this thing out with a couple of heat waves, as it does pretty minimal damage with a fusion flare. And in the end, this actually works out really well, since I want to start off the battle against Getsis using Volcarona so that I can set up some quiver dances against the Cofagrigus. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves here. You see, Cofagrigus has Tux, which is something I really don't want to happen to Volcarona. So I've given Volcarona a Pecha Berry just so that we can heal off that poison, but the Toxic misses the first turn so I can go for another Quiver Dance, and then it goes for Shadow Ball? I don't know what kind of 9,000 IQ play this guy's trying to pull, but this just means I get yet another Quiver Dance before we can heal off this Toxic with the Pecha Berry. And I'm well aware that Getsis loves to use Protect after using Toxic, but I can't really risk not taking this thing out the turn afterwards since I could get toxic once again, but this just means that we can clean sweep through Getsis' entire team, which is always a massive relief because if you don't find a good way to sweep this guy's team, he's sure to give you trouble. Finally, the Toxicroak actually gets off a Sucker Punch, but gets punished with the Flame Body and then taken out by Heat Wave. What a scrub. Get a life, Getsis. After all that Space Pirate nonsense, we meet up with N, who gives us the TM for Waterfall. We then go ahead and surf to this guy's house, where we can pick up the much-needed TM for Flamethrower, which can power up a lot of our Pokemon. But since we now have Waterfall, we can access the Abundant Shrine, which is the final location where we can find an encounter, and this time, it's Vulpix. I catch it and name it Curry, and it has an impish nature, which is terrible for Vulpix. I keep getting bad natures this run. Either way, one Firestone later, and we get the final evolution on our team and add nine tails. Axel, I can't let you win this run. There can only be one Swede. Game on, Sven. He starts out with Unpheasant, so I go into Hot Dog to get that Intimidate off and to burn this thing to do less damage. He then uses Swagger, which means I get confused, so I have to swap out and I decide to go into Ghost Pepper. This works out brilliantly since I dodge the facade being a Ghost type, and then Aerial Ace does barely anything as I steal his Scope Lens with Thief. I then go into Curry to deal the final hit, since I want to have a fast Pokemon out that can use Will-O-Wisp on the next Pokemon. So after we take out this hideous bird, I expect Bufalant to come out, and that's exactly what happens, so I hit it with a Will-O-Wisp, it then retaliates back with a fairly powerful earthquake that does just under half, but just to be safe, I decide to swap out into Pork Barbecue. Now, I'm not exactly pleased with the idea that I might get crit by an earthquake here, but I'm gonna have to risk it and set up a few workups, and we actually get down into pretty dangerously low health territory after the second earthquake as I go for another workup. Finally, a third earthquake gets me down to just 44 HP, and I decide at this point I have to go for a plus three flame charge to take out the Bufalon and boost my speed. This speed boost is going to be absolutely necessary to take out the Samurott, which doesn't have Aqua Jet, so it's not going to be able to outprioritize us, and we can just take it out with a single Thunder Punch. Finally, we got Simisage, which really isn't that much of a threat since it's a Grass type, and we can just take it out with a single plus three Stab Flame Charge, and that's going to be it for Sven. That's right, Sven. The only Swedish guy who's anybody in this video is the guy with the, the swoopy hair whose forehead you should be subscribed to at this point. After that fight, I spend tons of time looking for just the right gems I need. And with that, I've put together the final team that we're going into the Elite Four with, and the only thing I can say beforehand is that I've never played Challenge Mode before, so I was very scared of this going in. And so with intense preparations and strategizing out of the way, it's time to take on the final Ultimate Challenge. And while I say that I was very afraid of the Elite Four, Chantal was never part of that equation. You see, Chandelure has a base special attack stat of 145, so all I had to do was slap the Choice Scarf 
up on this thing and pretty much just steamroll through all of Chantal's Pokemon. Just the fact that Shadow Ball is both stab and super effective against every single one of our Pokemon makes locking ourselves into it pretty much a no-brainer. So that's it for Chantal, and I decided to take on the Elite Four the way you probably should every single time in a Nuzlocke and do the least difficult ones first. So next up we have Caitlyn, who starts out with Musharna. Her strategy here is that she has a zoom lens on her Musharna, which means that she's going to hit Hypnosis pretty much every single time. So I slapped a Chestoberry on this thing so that we can wake up and then take it out with a Silver Wind. However, feeling confident since I have plus one special defense and our next Pokemon is Sigilyph, I decided to set up a couple more Quiver Dances just so that we can be sure that we're going to take out the other Pokemon in one hit. And as we set up Quiver Dances, obviously we're taking these Air Slashes better and better, but it actually misses an Air Slash, so I decided to set up a fourth. Now, very fortunately for me, the RNG gods didn't decide to curse me with getting crit here, so I can just freely take out all of our Pokemon with one hit, revealing to everyone and not really surprising anyone with the fact that Volcarona is really goaded. This means that we've defeated two Elite Four members and we only have two to go and our next opponent is Grimsley and his Dark Types. Grimsley starts out with his Lipard, so I go into Large Fries and the very first turn I get Normal Gem Fake Out, which does a fair amount of damage, then I get Attracted, but Large Fries breaks through the power of love with the power of Brute Force. Grimsley's second Pokemon is Crocodile, which does have Intimidate, so I'm pretty much forced to swap out here unless I want to eat an Earthquake, and I decide to go into my own Intimidator. I do still have to tank that Earthquake, though, and it does a whole lot of damage to Hot Dog. I live on 41 HP and swap out into Habanero, who actually dodges a Rock Tomb. That could have been deadly. I seriously expected him to go for the more powerful Stab Earthquake, but I guess this is where those 3000 IQ plays are coming out, but when Scrafty comes out, I swap into Pork Barbecue, who gets its speed lowered by a Rock Tomb. I then get hit by a pretty puny Brick Break and retaliate with a strong Hammer Arm to take this Scrafty out of this world. Grimsley's next Pokemon is Absol, and I make a pretty silly mistake right here. I go into Habanero, and it goes for Swords Dance, and the next turn, I go for my last Silver Wind. And the fact that it just clean takes out this Absol isn't really a problem in and of itself, but the final Pokemon is Bit Sharp, and I forgot that I gave this thing Choice Scarf, so this means I end up using Struggle instead of Flamethrower, and just barely surviving an Aerial Ace, I do actually end up getting a pretty cheeky burn right here with Flame Body, after which you have to tank an Aerial Ace with Large Fries. Bisharp then misses a 100% accurate Night Slash because of my Bright Powder, and I can just take it out with a Brick Break, so all things considered, that was pretty easy. The final opponent we're gonna face in the Elite Four Gauntlet is gonna be Marshall and his Fighting Types. He starts out with Throw, so I go into Habanero, and with the Expert Belt item, Psychic is actually just a clean one-hit KO on this thing. And honestly, since it's not Stab, I was pretty surprised at this, but then he sends in Conkledur, and my calc said that Psychic was gonna one-hit KO this thing too, so I go for it, and it ends up happening. However, next up is Sock, and this thing can be a bit more tricky since it has the sturdy ability, so I decide to swap out into Hot Dog to lower its attack a bit with Intimidate first. And my plan here is fairly simple. Use Hot Dog to preferably tank a hit, and then go for Will-O-Wisp to burn this thing and get rid of that pesky sturdy. And the stupid AI ends up going for Payback here instead of Rock Slide. No idea why, but this gives me a free switch into Hot Pocket. And since this Sock is burned, this gives me the perfect opportunity to just set up a few curses and amnesias against this thing. And since I once again have the simple ability, this is going to be a twice as effective strategy, and I do need those amnesias just because he does have a Lucario in the back with special moves, so I want to get as prepared as possible while facing this thing. After I felt like I had enough boosts and the Sock was getting pretty low from burn anyway, I decided to just take it out with a Lava Plume. This means that Marshall's next Pokemon is Mian Xiao, and this thing can be kind of scary with high jump kick, but it actually ends up missing, and I burn it, so at this point, it really shouldn't be able to do anything to us. It does, however, unfortunately have the move Bounce, which means it's going to waste a turn, but I did go for Amnesia to max out my special defense, so it ends up working out pretty well, since I'm a lot slower than this thing and can just take it out with a Lava Plume. I did end up getting pretty lucky with the fact that I didn't get paralyzed, but finally, we only have Lucario left to face, and we should be able to take it out with a couple of Lava Plumes. It does set up the Calm Mind, which is kind of scary since it boosts its special attack, but since we have plus six special defense, the incoming Aura Sphere basically doesn't do any damage for being a plus one Lucario, and we can just take it out with a Lava Plume, meaning that we got through the Elite Four without any deaths. This means we only have one final challenge left, the Champion Fight. It's going to be Iris's full team of six versus our band of fire types. Now, all of Iris's Pokemon resist fire, so we're gonna have to think outside the box for this one to even stand any kind of a chance. And Iris starts off the battle really scary with a Hydreigon that knows Surf, so I decide to give the Choice Scarf to Large Fries, who can then finish off this thing with a superpower. But this in turn kind of puts us in a compromised position, since superpower lowers both attack and defense, so whatever comes up next is going to have an upper hand. And even though it's quad super effective, superpower isn't stab, and we 
R minus one attack, so I decide to swap out large fries for pork barbecue. The Aggron then misses a head smash, so I can freely go for a hammer arm, but I miss mine. I guess that's karma for you, but the next turn, Aggron doubles its speed with Autonomize, and I go for a hammer arm, but this time it's faster, goes for the head smash, but can't quite get the KO, so a fighting gem boosted hammer arm takes out the Aggron. This puts us in a similar position as before, because now we're minus speed as Iris sends in her Lapras, so I have to do something kind of drastic here, and I switch in Hot Pocket. And Hot Pocket came in clutch versus both Chorus and Marshall, but now it's going to make one final sacrifice for the team and go down to a Hydro Pump. And this means we get a free switch into Ghost Pepper, who can go for an Energy Ball, which I taught it through TM, but it doesn't quite take out the Lapras, and we get hit by a Hydro Pump to get taken out. Except by some miracle, the stars align, and we survive on 17 HP, and since we outspeed, we can take out the Lapras the next turn with an Energy Ball. That came in very clutch, but Iris' next Pokemon is Archeops, and this thing is way faster than we are, and just ends up taking out Ghost Pepper with a Dragon Claw. This means we only have four Pokemon left, so I decide to go into Scarf Large Fries, who can easily outspeed because of that boost, and go for a Super Power, which doesn't quite take out Archeops. And when Archeops is below half health, it actually has half attack, but even still, it manages to one-shot us with a Stone Edge. This means that the current standing in the battle is three versus three Pokemon, and I swap into Habanero as Iris goes for a full restore. That same turn, I hit the Archeops with a Flamethrower, which does pretty much exactly half, and I can take it out the next turn with another. And it also means that we're put in the lead three versus two, and Iris' next Pokemon is her Drudagon. And I managed to take it down to about half health with a Psychic from Habanero, but an Outrage takes us down to our Focus Sash. Hilariously, we also get the Flame Body proc, which is what, like the fifth or sixth time in this run? After that, we take out Drudagon with a Psychic, which means that Iris is down to her final Pokemon. And I know that this Haxorus has a Focus Sash and that I can outspeed it with Habanero, so I decide to go for a Psychic just to break that Sash, which unfortunately means that Habanero is going to fall as well. This means we're down to our last two Pokemon, which happen to be the first two Pokemon we ever got on this journey. But I came prepared. I knew that this moment would inevitably come, and I gave Hot Dog a normal gem and used my priority extreme speed to win this battle. And with that, this means that I did it. I beat a Pokemon White 2 Hardcore Nuzlocke in challenge mode using only fire types. And what did I learn this run? Well, despite the fact that fire types are super awesome and some of my favorite type of Pokemon, I think I'm actually better at this game than I give myself credit for. I was incredibly worried about playing this game on challenge mode. I've never done it before, but I actually think it made it more fun to prepare for the new teams that all the gym leaders had. And overall, it was just a really good time to play through Pokemon Black and White 2 again, as it always is. And if you guys had a good time as well, maybe you can drop this video a like. And if you're not subscribed yet, what are you doing? Additionally, I'd like to give a special thanks to Silph Spectre, who made a guest appearance in this video. If you guys haven't subscribed to him yet either, what are you doing? Seriously. His link is, of course, going to be down in the description below, and if you guys stayed all the way to the end of the video, then you're the champ, and I appreciate your existence. And until we see each other next time, have a good one.